What's going on everyone? It's Rich Haywood here from Bacon Ice Cream Productions and Team RTFC. Welcoming you to yet another episode of Good Times with Retro Rich. So today we're continuing the Intellivision Amico takeover of Bacon Ice Cream Productions. Stay three. As we just had the fun for five yesterday as I knocked some stuff over. Um, so I hope you guys had fun with the fun for five. It was pretty cool for us to do. It was a little different than our normal fun for fives, but hey, that's you know, it's a special occasion. Special occasions call for, for special things. So, anyway, today we're going to be talking about this thing. Yeah, just kidding. It's not, it's not really a controller. I just, you know, I have a 3D printer, so, you know, I figured I'd try my hand at, like, doing this. I did this months ago. Um, you know, you can even take it apart. You got the little things there, that there. The little, I even tried to do the little grooves. It's close. It's kind of close. It's like way, way bigger, way wider than the, than the real thing. Way longer than the real, real thing too. But um, but anyway, I was just messing around. Obviously today we're talking about the the Intellivision Amigos controller, in as much depth as I possibly can for the day and a half that I had it around me, and um, you know, tell you my thoughts, feelings, and share you some cool stuff. Maybe some speculation, and then kick it off to you guys, of course, to get back in the comments and let me know what you guys think, because that's what we do here on the channel. So, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different bullet points, and what I want to start with, <clears throat> which is, a th is one of the things that's missing in this little print that I got here, and that's that D-disc. It's pretty awesome. It's so so smooth now i know i probably mentioned that in a couple other videos about the the smoothness of the controller but it really it defies the description you you literally just have to actually have the controller in your hand put your finger on the disc and then actually move it to understand what i'm talking about it's unlike any other controller i've ever held and I've held a lot of them. I have an Intellivision controller right here. I've got my 7800, my Dogbone SNES controller. I've got a PlayStation controller lying around here somewhere with analog sticks. I've got a, I've got a Switch with its uh, Joy-Cons. I've got, I've, got I've got basically all of them. The closest analog that I can think of to the D-Disc is probably the Saturn roundish controller or uh, uh, roundish d-pad or the d-pad maybe even on the evercade it's kind of it's kind of similar it's a lot different because in the saturn d-pad and the evercade d-pad there are like little ridges inside you can feel them under the plastic as you press down it's catching the i think it's eight directions or even 16 as you're pressing down the d-pad it kind of has ridges that that hold where that is where the D-disc on the Amico controller, no, it's, you, you press it down and you can just rotate that bad boy all the way around over and over again. There's zero resistance. I, I don't know how it's, I don't know how it's done. And, and these controllers that we were holding, they are dev unit controllers put together probably over a year ago. And the disc still feels that solid and I don't even know how many tens or hundreds or more of people have had this thing in their hands playing for hours and hours and hours and the thing still feels that smooth. That's, I mean, I want to talk to the engineering team, to be honest. I mean, how did you do it? That's, that's what I want to know. Because it's interesting. It's very interesting to me to, that it feels that smooth. And for that long. I mean, of course, I mean, the original Intellivision controller, and I said it in another video, you can press that thing down and then move it around. And it, yeah, at first, brand new controllers, they feel pretty rock solid. They pretty, feel pretty smooth. You're moving them around, and that's, that's pretty nice. But they're not, you know, over time, you get grit in there, you get dust in there, you get all that kind of stuff. I mean, how does the thing stay this solid and this smooth for that long without getting that grit in there? It's weird. It's weird. But the cool thing about the D-pad, or the D-disc, I should say, is the fact that it does have difference in feel for different games and they make sense so 
What I mean by that for games like Astro Smash or Finnegan Fox, for example, you've got traditional left right motion. And if you rock your thumb back on the, the, the disc portion, it will respond kind of like a D pad and allow that motion. You know, it may be a little, um, you know, you can feel it rotate a little bit, but it's more moving with your thumb than anything, but it, it knows what you're trying to do. It, it knows that, okay, I'm trying to push left and now I'm pushing right directly and it will correspond in that, in that motion. So that's kind of, that's kind of cool. So it can act like a traditional D pad, which is cool. But then for games like flying tigers and rigid force redux, you get that whole 64 point thing or the 60 point, whatever the, however many points it is, um, motion. And that's when I think it really starts to shine. The, the D pad really starts to shine because now you can make maneuvers to the, um, to the, to the gameplay scenario that you really couldn't in other controllers. I mean, yeah, on an analog stick, you do have that, that kind of range of motion. So you can kind of push, and and uh, and and rotate in a in a bigger arc, but the 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 radius or the circumference of that that analog stick is smaller than the D disc. So your range of motion, your arc of motion on the on the disc is actually wider as you're moving your thumb around, and it it does feel different. It does actually make it feel like in in those flying games that you are banking a turn and you're and you're doing it in a in a wide enough arc where it it feels natural almost like you're almost in better control of the plane than simply doing that with an analog stick and moving that short arc where it's almost unbelievable where a, you know like the plane is just gonna you know like scoot over that that far or whatever you know like rip it or rip itself apart if it was a real plane or whatever but in this particular um in this particular example, I mean, it's a lot, like I said, it's a lot wider turn. So you're like, it's kind of hard to explain, but the, the, the plane kind of just does one of these kind of things where it's, where I would almost like, you would see a real plane kind of, you know, like moving along with the, the wind, so to speak. It's, it's interesting. It, it feels different. And I, I think it feels, it feels pretty good. It feels like a, a welcome difference than, than some of the other controllers especially for the games that they're, they're, uh, they're playing. Now, would I want to use the D-Disc on a first-person shooter, for example? No, of course not. I mean, that's it's almost to the realm of silly talk. I mean, you, you need, one, you need two of them on, on one controller, and then you, you're using your shoulder buttons and stuff like that. I mean, it, was, it would just get weird um, to do that. I mean, is it po technically possible? I mean, I'm sure someone on a dev team somewhere with an Amico controller and a dev kit could, could make a first person thing happen. You know, you, you could wind up using the, the screen, which we're going to talk about in a second as that second analog. And it'd be dicey, but anyway, let's just say the D disc. It's cool. It's cool stuff. Rock solid, smooth, and, um, definitely, definitely a good time. So then, Let's talk about the size, right? When my 3D printed brain, I, I made one that was kind of thin, right? Almost like a little thicker than a cell phone. And that's kind of what I imagined. You know, obviously not as wide, of course, but I was kind of imagining that the controller was going to be like that when I, when I held it in my hand. And then when I saw it, Tommy turned around with the Amico in his hand while I was over there on that Friday night. I was like, whoa, those things are pretty chunky. And the first thing I thought in my head was like, man, those things are going to be heavy. He's going to hand me one of those controllers and I'm just going to be like, oh, well, here we go. How long am I going to be able to hold this thing? But surprisingly enough, those controllers are really light. Eh, probably about as light as this 3D printed thing I got in my hand. You know, and that has the screen and the gyroscope and the accelerometer and the, the, the D-disc, which I just talked about, and the buttons and all that kind of stuff, all that stuff in there. And it's, and it's really light, but it doesn't feel cheap light. It feels just light. Like it was meant to be. It was meant to be that light so you can hold it in your hand for a long time. But solid enough where it doesn't feel like you're gonna break it in half if you, you squeeze too hard on the screen or you know, like move the D-disc the other way or something like that, which is neat. 
It's neat. The buttons too on the on the shoulders, uh, they all feel responsive. I've, they've got this kind of concave thing in the button. You can kind of sit your finger inside of the button. Um, and I found in some of the games that required lots of tapping, that's an advantage because your finger's already kind of there. You can just depress a little more and, and you're, you're that much closer to the, the touch point on the inside of the controller with the button, which is, uh, it's cool. It's an advantage. <clears throat> so let's move on to the screen, which is not here because this is fake. I think it's cool. I think it's useful. Um, it is responsive. It is just as responsive as me touching the phone that's recording this video. And it's got the same capacitive touch, so I would expect that. And it delivers. When you touch it, the things that you want it to happen, happen. So, you know, in my experience, every single time I've touched on the, on the menu or anything, it did exactly what I thought it was going to do because my brain associates touching screens that are that small with my phone. So if my phone can do it as fast as I am touching, then, you know, or, or if the controller can do it as fast as I am touching my phone and have that kind of same correspondence, I'm good. And, and for everything that I've done on the screen, it has actually been that responsive. So that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And you know what? I mean, as gimmicky as it might be, or say, you know, like as people might say it is, you know, the stuff that appears on the screen, I like it. I, I like it. I like the logos that appear when you're, when you're first starting a game. I like the embedded menus. I like the fact that there are certain things, like in Astro Smash, you've got your, you know, just a, your little ship that has the, the, the blurring thing, which is basically just an icon that says, hit me because I want... You know, hit me if you would like to hyperspace, because that is the giant hyperspace button. But up in the right-hand corner, there's another little button that looks like a bullet. And if you hit that button, it's a toggle that will toggle auto-fire on and off right on the controller, which is kind of cool. It's a nice, it's a nice soft button that, that, is, that is useful. And in many, many, many other games, you can see that the configuration changes, and then you can have a pause button or a restart button or something else like that or some kind of indicator of what player you are what color you, you know your your uh, your designated player is or anything all sorts of cool useful information it's big enough though the stuff that's on the screen is big enough where you know you don't have to be like buried in the screen to see what's going on you just kind of like have to do one of these you know one of these numbers you're playing and you can just kind of you can kind of lift up a little so you can, you can just barely look down to see what you want to do. And that's, there's not a lot of information. It's not like you're just reading walls of text on the controller. It is quite simply one, two, three things at most, four maybe, um, on the screen. And they're all big, giant icons that are brightly colored in different configurations. So when you're lifting it up, you're like, oh, okay, cool. Say I'm playing Evil Knievel, for example. In Evil Knievel, there is a button that allows you to um, uh, continue or uh, hit accept, you know, to, like moving um, on in the menus or whatever. And then there's one that looks like a reload button, a refresh button on a browser, and that's exactly what it does in-game. If you hit that button at any time, you will reload the level. And because of the nature of that game, you're going to use that button a whole lot. You'll get yourself trapped or you're, you know you're going to crash and you're trying to get that perfect run. You don't want to watch the animation of the ragdoll happening. You just hit the button and you're, you're going again, um, which is pretty cool. So the screen, all that stuff, again, makes sense. It's cool. The handles. These things that I almost accurately recre recreated on this print. They feel good. They give you a place for your fingers to rest. To then help hold the controller in your hands as you're holding it. Um, think of them. Think of the hand. You know the 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 handles in here. Are these, these ridges, these concave ridges. Think of those like the jutting out of a Xbox controller or a PS4 uh, controller, right? Or a DualShock, right? Um, where you you want to have some place to rest your hands when you're having your controller in the in them. But if you're forced to hold it old school style you still want somewhere to put your fingers that isn't going to be flat because if you're if you're doing that for too long you know your your muscles in your hand are going to start hurting because even in holding a dog bone controller or nes controller or the master system controller that hyperkin thing that i play all my master system games on you, 
it, you can get a little wear. But the cool thing is now you can slot your fingers in there and it's just that little bit of added support. You're actually helping hold the controller in four or five different points on your hand. And that feels pretty good. You know, that feels pretty good. So again, maybe longer gameplay sessions, you know, will, uh, you know your hand won't hurt as much. I mean, who knows? I didn't get to play that long, but, you know, it, it does kind of lend that itself. I was like, yeah, you know what? I, I probably would feel good if I, if I did that. And, um, you know, I didn't test the, the new controller layout with the, the little ridge for the, the controller dock thing. Um, you know, th those, those weren't there. Those, those particular controllers weren't there. But um, I don't imagine that would be too, too different. Or maybe even, maybe there's a slot. Who knows? Maybe there's a slot that makes it flat so that the rest of your hand doesn't feel anything different on the other side because of, the, because of that dock thing. I mean, who knows? So let's talk about something completely weird and innocuous, right? The USB jack that's on the side. You know, obviously you plug it in to charge. You can do that. You know, besides just plugging it in uh, to the Amico itself, if you want a super long game session and you've got, you know, whatever, a five amp charger and a charging cable, I mean, I've got two or three phones that take that in the house, so we can just plug that bad boy right in and charge the controller um, you know, without having to dock it, which is kind of cool. Um, I think it can be, it can also be plugged in and play, which is also cool because some controllers or some other peripherals that I've, that I actually own, um, I have a pair of headphones like that. You can't actually charge and listen to something at the same time or charge and use the device or something like that. So uh, that's kind of cool. But I mean, what do you think? Can the USB jack be used for something else? Well, I mean, as an IT professional, I and mean, of course, you know, if they had a firmware update for the controllers, the USB jacks right there. So, you know, they can say, hey, you know, go to the controller, you know, site on support dot, you know, whatever dot com, download your firmware and put it in. Now you get the new upgraded screen you know, icons or whatever if they, they changed the stuff or whatever. I mean, it'd be kind of cool, right? So... But who knows? Who knows? Who knows what the jack might be used for? Maybe it's plug your controller into this peripheral that uses USB-C because there's a USB-C jack also on the back of the control on the console, and maybe the controller plugs into some other peripheral that runs USB, and it's using power from the controller to to uh, you know make it work. Maybe you dock it somehow and you connect it, and then you know use the screen of the controller as the global control unit on the peripheral. Who, who knows? Who knows what could happen, but it's kind of cool that it's there. So, yeah, let's talk about the, uh, let's talk about the tilt action, huh? On the controller, though, some of the motion controls. The only game that was there that had actual motion in its control, I think, now don't quote me on this, but I think it's it was only Evil Knievel that had that. But I did play single player Evil Knievel, and just like on the phone, on the controller, your uh, your tilt of your your um, your motorcycle is the the tilting of the controller. So you don't need to use the D disc at all. Um, it's go forward and go backwards, and then tilt, and that's it. And it worked fine. In fact, it worked so well that. When I first started playing the single player uh, variant here of Evil Knievel, although I did not detect any familiar familiarity at all with the levels, with the level design, I think they are actually a little different. Um, some of the jumps are different. Some of the, the, you know, kind of like roller coaster ramp kind of things are different. So there, there are some, some differences between the, whatever the mobile version was and this version, uh, and at least in my opinion, um, cause I, I played a lot of the iOS version and I just didn't recognize some of these ramps. Um, but anyway, you hit the button to go forward, you hit the button to go back. And then as you're cresting over a jump, you, you've got to, you got to kind of like you know, put a little English on your jump to make sure you, you know, you're, you're having the right arc so you can land properly on the other side. And you got to be very precise about it because, you know, if you're off by a little, you know, you land like this, 
you know, on the ground and you're going this way and then that's a fail. You land too hard this way, you go over, that's a fail. You hit a fire, that's a fail. You know, that's, you know, you could fail 13, 14, 15 times before you get to it. But the long story short of the tilt stuff is that the, the tilting here and the tilting on that phone are pretty analogous. So they, they feel very similar um, with the, the gyroscope accelerometer combo so that, you know, it, it wasn't too much adjustment besides me adjusting to playing the game instead of the, on this screen, on a bigger screen, which, you know, changes the way you're, you're going to react while you're playing. It didn't take me too long to then finish one, two, three stages in a row because I kind of got, got my, got back in my groove. Like I said, I played a lot of the Evo Knievel on the iOS. So, I mean, you know, I, I had that familiarity, so I could just kind of like rifle through some of these levels, which is cool. But I cannot wait to get my hands on the Amico version because, I mean, not only could there possibly be some new levels, maybe maybe if they're all different in some way, those are just all new challenges for me, which is really cool. And the X1 uh, stunt cycle thing, the the, uh, the, stu the stunt rocket, uh, where you go over the the canyon, um, you know, how you control the, the pitch of the, uh, the rocket launch pad is of course with the tilt. Um, so you can tilt it, make it go up a little more, tilt it back down and make it, you know, go down as you're, as you're counting down to launch. And then, um, you got to pull the, the button to give yourself thrust so you can get a, go up in, into the sky and all that kind of stuff. So, but all that stuff worked and, you know, for, to me, it worked just fine. You know, there's no weird things going on I, you know, there's no like oh i did this and then like you know there's you know they didn't do it or there was you know no no uh you know like no response or whatever no all that stuff worked so you know good stuff good stuff and then here we get to the last part you know and we're gonna wrap this video the last part of this is the hidden factor of the controller um and i think it's because this is a multifaceted um thing that i want to talk about the fact that you can use the controller in this configuration or this configuration or this configuration or this configuration, if, if you really wanted to, um, is a really cool thing. I mean, certain games lend themselves to play better if you can hold the controller a little differently. So uh, I would imagine something like Skiing or Astro Smash or um, some of the classic and television games might actually feel better when you hold the controller vertically like this. You know, I had a good time with Astro Smash playing it that way, so so why not? You know, and, and why not some of the other games too? Like um, maybe even Rigid Force or uh, Flying Tigers when you you know you hold the controller like that to you know control your plane with your your dominant finger while you're you're hammering hammering away at the the fire button on the other. Why not? You know, that, that'd be kind of cool. But the thing that really unlocked in my head is because I I work in a alternative school. Um, for my, you know, profession, my, my real job, um, I work at a, um, an alternative school and in that alternative school, there, there are people that have, um, different special needs. And I started thinking, you know what, what if you handed the controller to them, you know, and for whatever reason, a traditional controller just doesn't work for them because again, they're right hand dominant and in that world, sometimes you know, their, their left hand is so non-dominant that they, they just don't, they don't have the ability, the tactile ability to, to control something like a D-pad with their left thumb, but they would be able to do it with their right thumb. And this controller, you can just put it in that scenario, you know, or say you can only use, um, you know, like one of, one of your hands. So just like you, you used a phone with one hand, you could use this controller pretty much the same way. And in, in most games, you know, the, the control schemes are simple enough where it is just simply um, one or two buttons uh, to control, you know, so, so you could, you could get it done. Um, you could most likely play Evil Knievel um, as long as they allowed mapping. You could play Evil Knievel with one hand, you know, and just put the, the backup button on the, on the bottom and, and you're forward on the top and then just tilt it with one hand. But it's kind of a cool thing. It's, you know, something to explore, you know, maybe, you know, that maybe it's something that they don't even intend 
to have happen, but it would open doors for not only this device, but gaming in general to, you know, corners of the market that had not seen a way to engage with gaming either. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of neat. So, hey, with all that being said, what do you think of this little thing? You know, I know many of you have not hauled, well, none of you have hauled this one except for me. Um, but, uh, you know, not many of you have hold, held the uh, Intellivision and Vehicle Controller. But what do you guys think of the, the theory and the, the stuff that we've been talking about and that kind of thing? Hit me up down below. You know, you got some questions. Again, I'm, you know, I'm here, I got answers. So, you know, let me know and whatever I can tell you, I will gladly tell you. Um, what, what I can tell you is, as my dog is laying directly on the <laughs> tripod, um, what I can tell you directly um, about the controller is I just can't wait to get it back in my hands. I think it's a really cool device and, you know, I'm looking forward to it, you know, even more and more. So, cool. Well, that's about it for right now. Of course, we kick it off to the friends. Of course, you know, go ahead, show your support. Go over there in the links below. Give them the likes, give them the subs, give them all the cool things. Tell them I said hi. Yeah. And then, um, you know, of course, watch their stuff. I mean, there's Amico content coming out of this event from all sorts of different stuff. Many of these channels are talking about it. So, you know, get some more opinions. Go over there and see what they have to say. You know? And then come back and say hi again. Want to talk about something that's absolutely not related to the Amico in any, any way, shape, or form, except for maybe the fact that there's a collection coming of old Intelli Intellivision games later on in the year? Boom. There's the Evercade guys. Check them out. Again, likes, subs, all the, fun, all the fun stuff. Um, check them out on the Facebook group. Check them out on the live session. You know, it's cool stuff. They talk Evercade all the time. We talk Evercade all the time on the Evercast, which is on a little bit of hiatus again because of what you're seeing right now in this takeover. We're on vacation, but you're still getting cool content from us anyway. Well, at least we hope it's cool anyway. So that brings us back to us here at Bacon Ice Cream Productions. We thank you so much for watching. On the way out, please hit the button because it'd be cool. I'm trying to grow the channel, get over that thousand marks. So we can do really awesome things for great causes because that is, of course, the mission of Bacon Ice Cream Productions to do all those things. And man, we got some cool stuff coming. When I get back from vacation, eh, maybe a couple weeks, and yeah, get a little get a little situations locked in order, you know, dot dot the T's, cross the I's, you know, you know the drill. Could be some really good times. So keep it locked here. Anyway, until next time, we will catch you next time for some good times. I'm Rich, and we will see you later. Take it easy, guys. Team